So hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the SIBO Survivor Show. And today I'm you know, excited and very fortunate to sit down with Angela Pfeiffer. Um, she's one of the nation's foremost functional medicine, nutrition, and health experts. She's an accomplished speaker and radio personality. Her 25 years in the health and fitness industry and in the past 12 years as a functional medicine nutritionist, focusing in the areas of digestive health, functional gut disorders, thyroid, autoimmune, and SIBO, have earned Angela recognition as a go-to gut health expert and just someone who can really help you restore your gut health and help you on your healing journey. She has a website, SIBOguru.com. Um, you can visit that to reach out to her and maybe get some help. She also started um, her own line of, of bone broth, which is low FODMAP, uh, FODMAP friendly, which is super cool. And then she also has a recipe website, which is basically an educational site where, you know, you can learn to, to cook and eat recipes and create foods that are helpful for your gut and can help your healing journey. So that's gut RX gurus. Mm -hmm. So if you Google any of those terms, I'm sure they'll pop right up. So yeah, I'm super excited to kind of sit down with Angela and to get, you know, her advice, her opinion, and, you know, to help you guys out to see if we can open your mind and, and help you to work with your doctor and to get results. For anyone who doesn't know you, can you give us a brief introduction of yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I've lived in Seattle all my life. I live here with my family. I have a lovely, uh, lovely husband and eight-year-old daughter. Um, I went to Bastyr University. Uh, initially, I was pursuing a PhD in psychology at the University of Washington and <clears throat> excuse me, had one of those epiphany moments where I realized that most medical doctors, kind of vast, vast, vast majority, probably 99.9% .9 are not getting any nutrition education whatsoever. And I don't know how anyone can practice medicine of any kind without knowing nutrition and without knowing the gut. So yeah. it's just one of those just moments where everything kind of stops and I'm like, okay, nutrition. And I, I, I literally drove to uh, Bass Deer, like as soon as I had that thought, I'm like, oh, they have a degree, I'll go check them out. And the director took me in her office for about an hour and it was just a no brainer. And it's like my life just unfolded in front of me. Um, I, 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 I work day in and day out a lot of weekends and I don't work. Like this is my hobby. So I'm like people ask yeah. me what my hobby is. I'm like reading studies. How do you yeah. relax reading studies? <laughs> That's the most interesting thing in the world to me. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. yeah it's, so. super, it's super cool though and interesting how you found that path without, you know, a lot of people go through the conventional system and it fails them. So then they look to that alternative path. Um, right. And I think it's really awesome how you found that on your own and you just knew that that was something you loved and that was something you wanted to learn and get into. So yeah. super cool. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, and then I work, uh, I do, I actually work virtually. So I work uh, nationally and internationally with people all over the world. Uh, a lot of functional gut, um, mainly SIBO. I think that's just what I'm you know, known for yeah. more than anything, yeah. but um, thyroid as well. I do a lot of work around thyroid, autoimmune, yeah. like so, so much is connected. Yeah. It seems, it seems like nowadays, especially like there's so many gut issues as well too. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, that's why a lot of people need help. So Definitely yeah. check your site out and, you know, get some help if you need it. Yeah, thank so you. So let's kind of dive into some of these topics. Um, I want to start with like a SIBO diet and, and diet in general if you have gut issues. Um, yeah. I know it can be confusing for some people. You go online and there's like four conflicting opinions. Um, and it's, you know, it can be really stressful trying to figure right. out what foods to eat, what foods not to eat. So, right. Um, let's just start with, you know, what is your kind of your recommendation and advice for, let's say someone comes to you with SIBO or a gut issue, mm -hmm. you know, what do you, what kind of a diet do you start with? Yeah. Um, I think I first look at, look and listen to the patient. Um, you know, I don't think there's a canned approach out there that's going to work for everybody. We really need to look at the patient's history, what we can gather from that, um, and what they're reacting to, what they've had experience reacting to. Um, you know, I get a lot of people that are, are in quite a chronic state. They've been through multiple rounds of antibiotics or herbals, and they've really whittled themselves down to, you know, not enough food, not enough variety. And so yeah. um, I do a lot of triaging with that and trying to help them expand yeah. uh, versus, you know, just getting that fresh person with SIBO and saying, ah, let's do this. Um, I'd say in terms of the diet, you know, I, it's probably something that's more FODMAP-esque. 
Um, Because I think, you know, as we start to look at what triggers symptoms for someone with SIBO, that their fermentation just completely makes sense. We see it reflected in terms of the symptom set. Um, So, you know, we start to see fructose malabsorption or lactose malabsorption, and that can be absolutely brand new in someone that's never had that before. But now that they have SIBO, they do. And with all the great resources and, and, and lab studies with the Monash University that actually show the fermentation load for each of these, you know, it's a, it's a really great tool and foundation to use, but that doesn't mean everybody has to go on a super restrictive diet. And I think, you know, as we, we you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about differing, differing opinions. Um, I think having all of these, um, I, I think the diets can be useful as guidelines. But I think for the layperson, it can get so confusing over which is the right one. Yeah. What can it do for me? And am I doing it right? And yeah. there, there can be so much like this mental game and drain and anxiety, which is going to make everything worse down here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that comes with that because everyone feels like, oh my gosh, I'm, um, I'm reacting. So steve getting worse. I yeah. did this to myself. I have to restrict more. And it's, it's really, really difficult, I think, for people to walk through that, especially on their own, especially on their own. So I'd say FODMAP S, but we, you know, I, I usually have people journal for about five days, eating as normally as possible, tracking symptoms. I have them list out what they can eat. I have them list out what they can't eat, because of course that five days is going to be a snapshot. And then looking at that and their history and their symptom set, we move from there. Um, and a lot of the time, it's not about pulling food. They've already figured out some of their main triggers. Yeah. It's not about pooling food. It's more about how do we work more variety in? How do we get you more stable? How do we get your body to accept this? And so it's not so hyper responsive and hyper reactive to everything. I think that's a big, a big issue that I yeah. see. Yeah. Such a good point on, you know, restrictive diets and kind of, you know, not going too crazy with that because, um, you know, you want people to get enough nutrition too, right? And I've right. actually had a personal experience being on a restricted diet and it was actually worse for my health in the long term that I found yeah. because I started, you know, eating like five or six foods and your body gets weak, right? Yeah. And, it, and yeah. you can't tolerate it. It's, it's, it's just, it's not good sometimes. So yeah. I think a really good point, just, you know, looking at FODMAPs, maybe fermentation potential and kind of going from there and working with your doctor. I think it's so important not to get too crazy about diet. Absolutely. Absolutely. And fermentation potential kind of goes into the fast track diet. I've not really seen that one work. Yeah. Um, It's more about to me kind of the load and how, how the food is presented. Uh, And it's nice to at least use some guidelines from the FODMAP list in terms of, especially when you're introducing new foods. You, yeah. you know that a third of a cup of this would be okay or two tablespoons of that would be okay. And that, you know, just in terms of the list, at least we could start from there and to build out. Um, I think it's really important as we start to look at, at the diet and, you know, we, 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 I, I think that whole, um, oh my gosh, how do I say this? Um, there, there's so many diets out there that everybody's confused on what to do and everybody yeah. keeps restricting and restricting and they're restricting and everybody is, not everybody, most people are spending too much time trying to research online on their own, which I, I know like you got to and at the other end, you, you have to like schedule that in and limit it because it's, it's going to be too much. It's going to be too overwhelming as you're trying yeah. to make sense of all of this and like, well, well then what's, what's right for you. And I think that's where it, that's where it's like this, how do we meet in the middle with all of these? Okay. How do we adapt your diet, treat your system, gently support the digestion, make sure that lifestyle habits are in place, get that person feeling more stable, opening up a little bit, not being so anxious about things. Like it's, there's this like big cycle of treatment that we have to do to support the patient. And it's not all about restrict everything and kill them. Restrict yeah. everything and kill him because the endurance just starts to tip down with that whole mentality. Yeah, and there's so much more to the treatment process than just diet, too, right? Oh, absolutely, um, absolutely. And then, so, I mean, do you see? You probably see that for different people, different foods they can tolerate differently, right? Yes, absolutely. Or, yeah, yeah. It has to do with, like, honestly, how much stomach acid they're producing, how well bile acids are being produced, how well yeah. digestive enzymes, and which digestive enzymes. The microbiota produces tens of thousands of digestive enzymes. So depending on what kind of balance or imbalance you have there, you're, you're more able to digest certain types of amylase, certain types, um, 
of, of you know, different ingredients coming in your food. Some people don't digest proteins as well. They get that really sticky peanut butter stool. Yeah. Um, some people don't digest fats as well. And so the, the stool will move a little bit faster. Their intestines will be a little bit more aggravated. They might dump too much bile acid, which is going to irritate. Like we really have to go through and figure out, you know, point by point what's going on. Yeah. So there's never a canned approach. And that's why I think um, it's, it's difficult to kind of pinpoint an exact treatment because it's, it's going to be different. Are you more sulfur type? Are you dumping bile acids? Like there's, there's really very specific things that we would do to help somebody there. Yeah, definitely. It's such a good point um, because everyone's unique and everyone has a different, you know, body. So it's yeah. really about kind of listening to your gut, working with, working with the food list to kind of check, but like going, yeah. really figuring it out for yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my next question is, um, what, what are the main foods that you usually see problems with? If there were foods that like everyone kind of had to be mm -hmm. aware of, what, what are they? Yeah, um, I've not ever seen anyone clinically with SIBO confirmed that can handle garlic and onion. Yeah. I just haven't. Um, stone fruits, I think, are the next ones. Anything with that big pit, like a peach or an apricot or plum, um, I see people react to those. Um, the brassicas, um, I think those are probably the, the top list of what I would see, you yeah. know, leeks more the white part, but those kind of get into more of that, that same yeah. family. So. I'd say more of that. Um, the the fructans category definitely is pretty reactive to people when we start to look at garlic and onions. Yeah, definitely. And I can personally attest to that. Even things like for me, it's like cauliflower and Brussels sprouts too, like those type of foods. Um, yeah, but when we look at those, you know, what I would say is that <clears throat> first, I'd want to make sure that sulfur metabolism is going well. Yeah. There's no burning stool burning gas, sulfur smelling gas. Like if, yeah. you know, if this is hydrogen sulfide type, we really need to pull some of those sulfur causing ones and do a full treatment just to keep the sulfur converting and yeah. not building up and, and creating havoc on havoc in yeah. terms of what sulfur does in the gut in yeah. addition to what SIBO is doing in the gut. Yeah, um, definitely. You know, that home motility piece. Um, but I think we really have to take it case by case and look at, uh, you know, if, if somebody wanted to include a couple of florets of broccoli without the stem part or just the tops and they're really well cooked, they might be able to do that in a, in a stir fry with the safer vegetables they can eat. It's not yeah. that we pull it completely, but then I'd also want to know that they're taking um, a good digestive enzyme to help break that down. Um, and then also, if, if that isn't possible, maybe look at something like broccoli sprouts, which are incredibly healthy and actually quite healing to the gut. Yeah. So I think we, you know, we, we need to look at this on a spectrum. What can the person handle? And also the education piece, um, food should be indistinguishable when it leaves your mouth. You should not ever see intact broccoli in your stool yeah. because you have chewed it so well that that could never happen. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I ask people if they see intact pieces of food in their stool, on one hand, obviously they're not digesting well, but on the other, yeah. they're not chewing enough. Yeah. Right? So we, we've got to look at that. We've got to make sure it's cooked through very, very well. Um, maybe put it in soup because that's going to be easier to chew through. Um, and then also think about if somebody can handle an eighth of a cup of really well cooked broccoli yeah. on day one, but say day five, if they took that same eighth of a cup of broccoli and blended it into soup, they now have completely changed the load. They yeah. completely changed how fast that blended soup that is already now like pre-digested that loads come down into the intestine tract at one time. Does yeah. that make sense, right? Yeah. So then you, yeah, and so then you're going to have reactions and go, well, why can't I have that? So we, yeah. we have to look at how the food's presented. Totally, and that's, that's another awesome point because, you know, the way you cook it matters, right? Like if you have an intestinal condition, like steaming it, putting it in soup, really cooking it well so that you give your body a little bit of a, you know, a help digesting yeah. the food. Yeah, um, yeah, blend, blending and juicing, unfortunately, aren't um, usually on top of the list when we're first starting out. We have to yeah. we have to chew and have our gut like slowly digest things and kind of release things into our intestines slowly, so we don't get that big load dropping. And we can probably manage to keep more variety in from the start. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's all about like you're talking about. It's all about getting as much variety as possible, right? Yeah. That's what we want people to get to. Yeah. Um, spices, herbs, anything green. Um, yeah. you, you really need it. Even if it's a couple tablespoons at each meal, it makes, it does make a difference. Yeah. It, it really, really does. Definitely. So are there any kind of staple foods or foods that you see that people do really well with for the most part? 
Yeah, I think that's going to just vary by person. It really yeah. is. Um, I don't think that there's any one, um, you know, I think some people do a lot better on proteins, but then um, some people have protein malabsorption and stomach acid issues. And it's, I think it's really just going to vary by person. So I don't think there's any perfect answer for that. Um, I think in terms of looking at somebody's history and what they've eaten and their list of foods of kind of what's in and out, I can start to see trends on where they're going with that. Yeah. Or if, you know, these three foods are okay, then they're probably going to be fine with the rest of the foods in that category. So we can start to expand there. So I think it's, it's really taking a really detailed history and having the conversation, you know, people have this, I have this idea that like, Oh, I had sweet potato and I had a huge reaction and like, well, how long has it been since you ate sweet potato? Oh, it'd been like months. So then they try it. And I said, how much did you have? And they, they, they didn't have that much. You know, they might have just a few bites of it, but they had a reaction. And so then I have to go through and explain, you haven't had that starchy amylase presentation in quite some time. Your yeah. body's going to downregulate digestive enzymes. So you have to actually take a digestive enzyme with it and realize you need to take a little bit of time to get used to it. Yeah. And I don't think people understand that as much, right? So yeah. if you start to look at like beans, if somebody like just normal digestion, whatever mm -hmm. that is, yeah. Somebody went and started, um, didn't have, you know, hadn't had beans for months, months and months and maybe years, ate some beans, yeah. uh, just a small portion. They're probably going to get a lot more digestive distress and gas than they would ever want. And then over a period of time, if they kept doing that, their system's going to get, quote, used to it. And that means that they're actually upregulating digestive enzymes to break it down. Yeah. So we don't forget how to digest food. But I think a lot of times, especially with the FODMAP group, people start to, they, they put their toe in once and they're like, oh my gosh, I can never have this. Like, mm -hmm. well, that's not how the system works. So you have yeah. to keep introducing that food over a period of time to get that adaptation. And so that's hard to work through sometimes. So we just yeah. a really small tablespoon, tablespoon like every other day and then let's work up a dose. That's such a, it's, that's so important. I think it's such a good insight because, um, you know, like you're talking about your body it adapts to what you put into it, right? What right. based on enzymes it releases and all that stuff. So it's like anything. If you don't, if you're not feeding it a certain, you know, plant material, then it's gonna, it's obviously gonna have issues for yeah. a little bit when you're reintroducing it. Agreed. Agreed. Um, yeah, super cool. So anyone out there, start slow. And if you want to test other things, it's great. Just start with small amounts. Yeah. And look for, a, look for a digestive enzyme that has a good presence of amylase in it. If you're yeah. going to start to add in more starchy things, that's going to be really important. Last couple of topics here on diet. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions about, you know, caffeine, alcohol, and sweets. Because let's face it, everyone loves those things if they sure. can eat them. But, um, you know, people with SIBO or people with gut issues maybe can't tolerate them. I just kind of want to get dive into those a little bit and, and yeah. you know, understand why and, and what the deal is with those. Yeah. Um, should, so, I, should I talk about coffee as I sip my coffee? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, <laughs> let's start. <laughs> it's not, it's not good. Yeah. Um, I, well, I live in Seattle. If that says anything, we, yeah. uh, the kind of the joke is like, well, I'll meet you by the Starbucks by the tree. You know, yeah. it's, it's like yeah. they're on every corner. We can't, we can't throw a stone. Um, hmm. So what I would say with coffee, especially when we're looking at a functional gut disorder, um, we have to, not even narrowly looking at a functional gut disorder, as we step back, if someone has a functional gut disorder, do we also see adrenal dysregulation, anxiety with all the health issues going on, sleep disturbances? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of reasons why drinking coffee would not be a good idea. Yeah. It's going to aggravate any kind of gastritis or ulcer or anything that's going on. You know, I see a lot of people with, without like, really clear gastritis going on with their endoscopy, but they've got some inflammation called out on their endoscopy and their duodenum. So drinking something like coffee or even tea is not going to be really helpful to them. That actually can yeah. be quite triggering. Um, we know coffee is going to speed transmission through, you know, transit time through yeah. the gut with the bowels. So if you've got faster moving stool and you're wondering why every time you drink your coffee, there's a little bit of stimulation going on there. It's, you're not going to yeah. get that good foundation and stability. Um, it's going to mask hunger. So if you are trying to stick to an eating plan, you can probably get by with eating a little bit less in the morning, but you're going to have to eat more as the day goes on because that's going to get unmasked a bit. So um, I think with, the, with, with all that taken into account, if that's not the case, if somebody is a bit more on the constipated side and they don't have adrenal dysregulation and they're sleeping fine, I think coffee with breakfast is not a big deal. Yeah. I really do. I don't think it's going to, you know, 
do anything negative to SIBO, but I, there's a lot that we need to look at to keep that in. Um, so I think, it, yeah, I think it's just case by case. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, that's cool because, you know, a lot of people, if they can, right, they like to have their little caffeine, their little yeah. stimulant to kind of get them going sometimes. Um, yeah. So next, next topic is alcohol. So yes. what do you see with people with gut issues and, you know, can they tolerate a little bit of alcohol sometimes? What's the scoop there? Yeah. Um, so I'd say with, with coffee too, um, you know, some, sometimes people need to live a little. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. not like you can never have coffee again or you can never have alcohol again. Um, yeah. I have great conversations with my patients leading into the holidays. Like, yeah. okay, how are we going to manage having a little fun because you've got to have a yep. little fun. Um, so exactly. I'd say with alcohol, alcohol is a toxin. We, we can't candy coat this in any way. That's the reason why we start to feel loopy. It's the reason why we get flushed. Like it's yeah. a toxin. It's absorbing out your stomach lining. It goes to the liver. So if we have any kind of uh, toxin burden, if we have any kind of gut inflammation, it's going to flare all of that. And then you've got to basically package those toxins to get them out of your system, which can ramp up faster stool, faster transit time. So again, with functional gut, you know, it may not feel like it's a direct reaction, but it's going to be, it's going to be indirect. It's going to add a load. Um, you know, I'd really recommend that people try to reset their alcohol intake and go two weeks or even go a month without any, just have yeah. a dry month to help reset because people start to lean on it too much sometimes. Um, I think people think it helps them sleep better and really it interferes a lot with sleep. It yeah, it really does. We detox a lot at night, having, have, putting alcohol in your system and then not having that, having your body like go, Oh, we have to now take, you know, take care of this toxin versus going through and doing anything, just the whole reset sy system, system repair, you know, overnight, yeah. you know, it's, you're, you're really putting a bit of a wrench in that. So um, yeah. again, it's, it's, it's case by case, but it's something that we really have to look at when we have an unhappy gut, putting alcohol in it is going to be more often than not triggering. Yeah, definitely. And that's kind of what I've found too, is like, you know, I can tolerate a little bit here and there, but like for the most part, I'm not going to go out and like drink a lot, you know, it's not going to be a good thing. <laughs> right. Right. And you're probably going to be more sensitive to it. Um, and as, as anyone going through SIBO treatment, um, <clears throat> it's, you're going to have, I think a hard time even handling yeah. that much alcohol. It's just, it's not going to go well. Yeah. Um, and then, so lastly here on the diet topic, um, what about sweets? Um, you know, people get naturally get a sweet tooth. They want something sweet. Um, it's hard on a SIBO diet or dealing with a gut issue because yeah. a lot of times that sugar that sometimes the fructose can feed that, um, make things worse. But you know, what have you found that's good for maybe a little sweet treat or something? You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just straight sugar is not triggering to SIBO. Um, it's yeah. SIBO like organisms associated with SIBO don't ferment straight sugar. Uh, we actually absorb it quite readily. And that's why yeah. we have a glucose test for SIBO because it absorbs in the upper one third small of the intestine. So we don't usually see a trigger um, further down. So um, that said, um, I think again, when we're looking at functional gut and looking at the system, sugar's inflammatory. We know that. We also know that it's going to ramp up cravings. So if you're actually, you know, try, trying to um, kind of feed that sweet tooth, you're going to have a harder time sticking with the plan overall. Yeah. Uh, I think if somebody is including that all the time, that again would be another reason to like, let's just take a break from it. Um, I recommend sometimes freeze dried banana chips or freeze dried um, strawberry pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I know that sounds really strange, but they're super sweet and they're dry. And they're like, so if you like slice a slice of strawberry yeah. and then they basically flash freeze it. So it takes all the moisture out of it. And if you put it in your mouth, like the whole thing is like candy. Like it just oh, doesn't wow. in your mouth and takes forever. Yeah. Like it's like a really strong flavor hit. And so it feels like you just did something cool. Yeah. Um, so I think those two can be nice. Um, real maple syrup um, is actually fairly well tolerated. So if you, if somebody had um, say a, a sweet potato dish that they could have some of, you might yeah. do just a, you know, half teaspoon or quarter teaspoon drizzle on that just to get a little bit of a sweet hit. And that might yeah. help Uh frozen banana where you actually drizzle a little um, with, with that up like frozen banana ice cream and put a little bit of maple syrup on top of it. If that is well handled, um, that might work as a little bit of a dessert uh, doing 24 hour yogurt and sweetening that 
um, or with maple syrup. Um, the fructose, the juices don't usually sit well with people. So yeah. I think usually I, I recommend people doing that and then putting blueberries on it or a little little drizzle. That, um, so 24-hour uh, yogurt, blueberries, um, some coconut flakes, and a little bit of maple syrup like does taste very sweet when yeah. the diet is otherwise quite bland, unfortunately. So it's, that might um, help boost the flavor a little bit for people. Yeah. Really great ideas. Cause you know, I've, I've actually found the same thing that you said, like I can't handle a ton of fructose. I have to watch that, but like regular sugar, a little bit here and there is usually yeah. okay. Yeah. This yeah. is the quick absorption. Yeah. Um, so just, Lastly, on diet, you know, what kind of advice you want to give, would you give to people, you know, who are kind of, let's say they're a little bit confused, you know, what's the takeaway here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned my site earlier, the Gut Rx Gurus um, site, and I just want to be clear, I don't, I don't have a diet that I've created for SIBO. Um, I think that there honestly is, it, there's, some of the diets are very helpful as a regroup if needed. Um, that means symptoms are all over the place and people don't know which way is up. I can see regrouping with some of those. Um, but I, I think the, there's so many diets out there and, you know, new ones are popping up every day. It's just breeding more confusion. Yeah. So I just wanted to create a resource that's like FODMAP, SIBO specific and biphasic where you can get recipes and do meal plans as resources. That's it. Um, yeah. so I want to just be clear of that because I don't have my diet that I'm promoting here. I didn't, I didn't yeah. like, Oh, people need to eat this and they're going to fix this. Right. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that the mantra in, in the head is that I need to nourish myself. Um, we've got to let go of fear. We've got to let go of anxiety around what we're eating in SIBO. We have yeah. to, we've got, we've got, you know, not great studies around FODMAP and breath testing, but you know, we've got studies looking at IBS, which at least 60% are, assumed SIBO when we have IBS and that's probably mm. lowballing it. So yeah. We've got three week studies and four week studies looking at a crossover study, looking at a uh, low FODMAP, which was under 10 grams of fiber and up to 50 grams of fiber for FODMAP and over three weeks on that diet and over uh, four weeks on that diet, we saw no change to methane and no change to hydrogen levels. Mm. So we really don't see that the diet changes those um, the only time I go more restrictive with FODMAP and at least just trying to get on that plan is if somebody has just blatant histamine reactions going on because we do see a reduction. <clears throat> we do see a reduction with a histamine load on FODMAP, but that does not mean that everyone has to go on FODMAP. That does not mean that everyone has a histamine issue. We all consume histamines in our diet. We all process them and do whatever we need to with them. And it's fine. That's the histamines aren't causing anything. Yeah. Um, Unless you have a histamine issue, it's totally different. Yeah. Um, so that's the only time I might go a little bit more um, like, okay, let's get on this plan because we can calm that down as we put all the support in to convert the histamines and get them out of your gut um, and try to calm down that systemic reaction that goes on for people with histamines. So uh, that's why there's no one size fits all. Um, if you're new to a SIBO diagnosis, you don't have to look at all those plans and try to figure out, oh my gosh, which one is the right one for me. Yeah. Um, Look, look at what you're eating and maybe use the, the FODMAP diet just as a guide mm -hmm. and then move from there. Um, you know, as we look at the diets, we've got um, SCD, um, specific carbohydrate diet. We've got the GAPS diet. We've got the FODMAP diet. And then the SIBO specific food guide is basically the FODMAP diet and SCD combined. And then the biphasic is the SIBO specific food guide in two yeah. phases. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's, there's, they're all kind of, and it's totally fine, but they're all kind of feeding off the other ones. But it seems like when you look at five diets, you're like, oh my gosh, which one do I do? Yeah. Like they're, you know, SIBO specific combines two of them. And biphasic is basically the SIBO specific and phased, phased out. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So the, I mean, in conclusion, all the diets are very similar, right? It's about kind of tweaking them and working mm -hmm. to find the foods that yeah. you can tolerate well. <laughs> right. Um, so let's kind of let's kind of move on to a next, you know, kind of controversial topic as well. Um, probiotics. Uh, yeah. Some doctors don't recommend them. Some do. Um, and then, as always, you know, it's kind of a case by case and a testing yeah. issue as well. So. First of all, do you usually incorporate probiotics in your treatments? Yeah, from the start, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it, I really, again, this goes back to history with the patient. 
what have you tried? Where are you at? Some people have already tried some things that didn't work for them, and we got to kind of breeze through that. Um, sometimes I'll get people up onto a, a protocol targeting something, and then we'll add pro probiotics in a couple weeks later. So, you know, not maybe from day one, but I'd say within the first month, there's a probiotic of some sort being yeah. added in. And I think they're, they're, they're necessary, especially with the SIBO group. Um, first of all, we have studies. Go, go look them up on PubMed. We have studies showing that probiotics yeah. were effective as rifaximin at getting to a negative breath test. Yeah, I've seen got, those. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. We've yeah. got great studies on bacillus coagulans with IBS and IBS symptoms. They're beautiful. Tons of studies on those. So we're not, we're not um, shooting in the dark here. We yeah. really know that there's some, you know, improvements to be had with them. Um, we get, you know, and I think when we start to look at SIBO and healing up the gut, we, everyone thinks, I have an overgrowth, we got to kill it, and then I'm going to eat sauerkraut and I'll be better. And <laughs> that's not quite <laughs> how we go about things. Um, yeah. When What we really want to do is start to look at um, how are we going to improve the immune tolerance that's surrounding the gut and interacting with the gut to help create an environment that we can rebalance the gut in. Yeah. And that's a really, really big deal there. And so when we start to look at probiotics, we don't take a probiotic because it seeds the gut. We take a probiotic because its DNA crosstalks with our immune system and helps to train it, helps to get it to chill out. Yeah. And so we, we can make the environment more hospitable for the beneficial flora to bloom up and, and keep this nice balance. So we use it for that. We use it for gut healing. Um, we use it because it makes um, – it, it decreases pathogen ability to take hold and have an issue, you know, create, create havoc and wreak havoc in our system, which for anyone who's had SIBO is a really big deal. We do not want a reinfection. We don't want, I even hate using the word infection. We don't want a, a re overgrowth. How do I say that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> we don't want to tip that balance again and have an issue. Um, but no, I guess, I guess um, reinfection would be the right word. So I was talking about pathogen. So that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so like post-infectious IBS. We have those, those people are much more prone to getting another exposure, um, which is really interesting because the, the couple of studies that are looking at this, if I can mention these real quick, um, there was a, uh, this big um, exposure to contaminated water, um, and the study was done on the people to see how many people actually got acute gastritis because of it, infectious gastritis, mm. um, in, infectious gastroenteritis. Yeah. Uh, and then um, they went and actually looked at that group again a year later to see who got post-infectious IBS, which is SIBO. And what they found was people with anxiety were predisposed because of the immune shift that happens in the gut. They were predisposed to actually getting the gastroenteritis to begin with. And then that, it depends on, um, as they looked at people along that year, um, that overall symptoms that couldn't be explained um, made those people and younger age made those people more prone to actually getting post-infectious IBS. So they actually see an immune shift, the immune cell infiltration, leaving people maybe more susceptible to getting, um, to being more susceptible to, to a pathogen because all those people got exposed. So yeah. what made those, that one set set, right? Yeah. So I and feel that's... like even for people that don't have post-infectious IBS as it's the SIBO setup, once they get SIBO, this whole anxiety piece kicks in of course, of course, around functional gut, but also around eating, and their day gets all consumed by it, and all consumed with, with reading everything on the internet, and then we've got this whole anxiety piece that's playing a role in them not getting better. Yeah, and it's such an important point because, you know, it goes back to, like, why is it occurring in the first place, right? And, like, there has to be, whether it's your immune system isn't functioning properly, your body is not strong enough, right, to where that, you know, that disease state or that overgrowth occurs like so it's and and the point you made up about point you brought up about probiotics too where they affect it's more than just reseeding your gut like you're talking about it's it's building your immune system it's strengthening your other functions of your body so that you don't you aren't susceptible to that overgrowth right i think that's right. so important yeah right um so i'm just so in the, in, with probiotics in, in cases of SIBO, um, you know, where have you found that maybe they're really tricky to incorporate and like, how do you usually go about trying them? Slowly, yeah. <laughs> slowly. <laughs> um, I think as ever, any practitioner out there, we do our research, we see what's been used in this field, we see what strains are being used, and then we also go off our clinical experience. Um, we can, I, I look at um, Espilardi, 
Um, bacillus coagulans, absolutely. Um, uh, oh gosh, what are my other ones? Um, sometimes megaspore biotics, sometimes prescriptosis. It just depends on the person and what they've used in the past. Yeah. Um, be in Ramnosis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ramnosis absolutely is another great one. Um, yeah. L. rudii is another good one. Um, and Ramnosis GG, it's very specific to the strain. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, I think those can be helpful. Um, I think, you know, again, this kind of mirrors going back to saying like, oh, somebody, somebody wanted to start eating a little bit more. So the sweet potato had a reaction and was like, oh, yeah. can't do yeah. this anymore. It's the same thing with probiotics. People will have, so, someone will tell them, go take this probiotic that has like multi-billion strains yeah. in it. They have a reaction and then they're like, I can't ever do a probiotic again. Yeah. Well, that's because you took way too much. That's because anybody with normal digestion, if I gave them a heavy handed probiotic, they're probably going to have an upset stomach and lose stool for a couple days. So yeah. if you see that in a SIBO patient, oh my God, it's going to be like a week of not happy, right? Yeah, so exactly. um, I always have people and do the lower dose ones, they open up the capsule, they tap a little bit on the back of their hand, they lick it off, drink some water, and then take it with a meal because it buffers it getting through the intestinal tract. So we just go really slow, and by really slow, they might do that for a week. Is everything okay? Great, yeah. like just double that. So we work slowly up onto it, um, because if we try to go really heavy-handed with any dosing of any kind, and they react, it's harder to get them up on it again. So everything yeah. is really dosed very slow. Yeah. So start, start really small and kind of monitor your reaction. Right. Yes. Um, and then is there any, do you usually try to, you know, even if someone's having a reaction, do you usually try to keep incorporating it even in small amounts or is there any time where you just say, Hey, like we need to hold off on these for a little bit. Yeah. It, it depends on the kind of reaction that's happening. I don't, I don't want anybody to sit in misery or sit with their symptoms completely set off. Um, yeah. But we really have to just take this, again, case by case and say, okay, was it, was it a little bit? Let's try it again. Still a little bit. Let's try it again. Got worse. Let's pull it for a few days. You yeah. know, we'll, just, we'll kind of bring it in and out a little bit that way. Or, or sometimes, too, I have people look at their day. Sometimes people are more reactive in the morning. Sometimes people are more reactive in the evening. And so we'll kind of space trialing something based on where they're less yeah. reactive. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's really just, you know, it's a process, right? Like yes. any oh, yes. journey, you know, how long do you usually see like it takes for, you know, someone who's trying to incorporate small amounts of probiotics to kind of get their gut to where they can tolerate them better or, you know, improve to the point where they're, they don't have as many issues. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's depends on where they're at in their healing journey. Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think if they're, if they've really lost a lot, a lot of oral tolerance, if they're whittled down to a lot of foods that they still feel like they're kind of reacting to, um, if leaky gut is present, um, especially if there's also autoimmune going on, um, it's, it's more difficult. That person has a lot going on and their system's just like, Oh my gosh, anything you put in me, I don't like it. I'm not supposed to be here. You know, um, especially for the group, any, any of the group that has low secretary IGA, yeah, uh, that group is a little bit um, more sensitive to things usually, but it just, again, it depends if as a clinician, we should be really learning from the past and what that person's been able to do or not. And so, uh, you know, we always have the conversation around probiotics. I have them go through and try. It's never, it's never perfect because people, again, have tried so much, you know, first of all, take a picture of everything you have in your medicine cabinet, you know, yeah. like 10 at yeah. a time. So I can at least see what you have. And then also listing out what have you tried before? And, you know, within a neutral response, you reacted to it and you're never going to touch it again or, you know, yeah. and how much of that. So we, we kind of learn from that. Um, and then I, I kind of know I might want to do something a little bit more single strain, lower dose. And, and just letting them know too, I don't care what dose is on the bottle. I could, yeah. I could care less. We are going to look at what your dose is. And if you're able to handle a quarter capsule every day, fantastic. That's your dose. If you go up to a half and you react, quarter capsule is your dose. We're staying yeah. there for weeks on end. And yeah. isn't that awesome? That spreads out even more. Really cost effective. <laughs> yeah. so I try to put a positive spin on it, um, but it's not about you know if the bottle says it's two that if they're not taking two that it's there's a negative there. You know we've yeah. got to get the system retrained. Like the 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 freighter in the ocean takes a long time to turn around. Yeah. It depends how fast it was going. You know mm -hmm. we really have to we have to slow that down and it's it's there's a lot to look at.
Yeah, that's, that's really helpful advice for a lot of people, I think, just because, you know, some people can get the idea of like probiotics are like the enemy, right? And yeah. like, I think it's important, right? Like start really slow. Like yeah. a lot of people with SIBO or with gut issues are naturally sensitive, right? So you're right. going to have to take it slow and you're going to have to really kind of listen to your body. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but I think too, um, you know, as we look at some probiotics, so um, again, I'm, I, I'm for all modalities and working as a team here. So I'm not yeah. picking on a mainstream medicine. Um, yeah. but there's a couple of, you know, floor store and a line and a few others, which are probiotic brands that have done studies on their exact brand and then marketed it to the medical doctors. Mm. And so then the medical doctors, as they should, hey, we've got a study on this. Look at what this does. Go take this. Yeah. Then you want to take Infloristor, which is basically Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces boulardii and lactose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you've got SIBO, why can't you just go take Saccharomyces boulardii without lactose? Yeah. Why do you have yeah, to take exactly. Infloristor? So I, I think people get kind of scared away on some of these. Um, or, um, I've, I've had some people come to me and their, their doctor recommended, you know, renew, renew life. Um, oh gosh, I think it's ultra flora and it's like, you know, a hundred billion. Yeah, yeah. And they wanted them to go take two. Yeah. And I'm just like, you know, and of course they're, the poor thing is like completely scared of probiotics for the rest of their lives because they were tied to the, the bathroom for a week. Of course, of course they yeah. are, but we, we've got to be a little more selective than that. You know, yeah. and really start to look at how, how to incorporate that a little bit more slowly and what, what makes sense to the patient. And so if they, they did that, um, you know, we'll kind of talk them through, but Clara Labs has a great Saccharomyces boulardii. It's a wonderful brand. It has, it has nothing else in it but Saccharomyces boulardii, which is really what we should be doing. Such, such important points. Um, and also the fact that like, you know, if you're introducing something, like if you're going to try and introduce 2 billion, it's like a nuclear war, right? You have to be right. kind of careful. Yeah. Introducing that much. Yeah. 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 And so um, I, would, I would do that more if somebody came to me and they had, you know, ulcerative colitis. They had something going on in their distal part of their colon. Yeah. And we're trying to evoke change down there. Mm -hmm. we, we still start slow and ramp up, but we go from the multi billions. We, we really, we, we got to get way down there. That's like, that's a totally different, like going, going from Seattle to Portland. It's a totally different area. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. We, we need to have your hand there. Um, but with the small intestine, like anything out of the gate, when that small intestine is lit up, we've got to microdose things. We have yeah. to go slowly with those. It, it makes a huge difference for the patient. Yeah. And especially like with the motility issue, right? If someone's yeah. not moving things correctly, you have to get that working as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so lastly here, I like to, you know, kind of get, I want to get your opinion on tricky cases. This is always kind of, you know, maybe a lot of my readers or a lot of my followers have been dealing with this chronically, or, you know, they're just trying to figure out what they can do to get their bat, their body back, you know, working correctly. So, yeah. um, you know, what do you, I just want to kind of pick your brain a little bit. Um, what are your first thoughts when someone continues to fail treatments? Let's say they've done, you know, three or four antimicrobial protocols yeah. and they, they, you know, they're on a restricted diet. Yeah. Um, you know, what do you, what are you thinking at that point? Yeah, absolutely. So if somebody comes to me and the protocols look pretty sound, yeah, I start to think about two things. One, we might need to rethink the diagnosis and two, what's getting in the way of the momentum sticking. Right. And so then I start to think about immunodeficiency, like uh, secretary IgA deficiency. Mm -hmm. um, I start to think of lack of oral tolerance that they're reacting to everything. Um, I start to think about all of those because they can't keep, I mean, whether, whether it's antibiotics or herbal antibiotics, we can't keep beating our head against the wall and just saying, it's not gone, take more. It's not gone, take more. Yeah. That doesn't work. Um, I do see a lot of people will, that will, float in and out of treatment. So they'll take X treatment for a month, nothing for a few months, then kind of symptoms rear again, and then they'll take more again. And we really need to treat SIBO um, with the consecutive treatments, get a negative breath test, and then work on equal amount of time on the other side, four to six months, healing up the gut, working on the immunoregulatory pathways, settling everything down, making that area an environment really hospitable to keep the peace. That takes a ton of time. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we really need to look at, um, what could be getting in the way and if it was treated properly. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm going to be really mindful here in working with anyone. I don't come in with blinders and say, 
aha, this is SIBO, it's the root of everything that you have going on, you yeah. gotta treat it, gotta treat it, gotta treat it, and my protocol is better than that protocol, we're gonna fix yeah. it this time, because that's, it's, that's, that's not what we need to do with SIBO. Um, even if someone comes to me, and this is with every single patient, if somebody comes to me and they've been like, I've had SIBO for four years, here's all my breath tests, here's how long I've been treating it, like, I try to disprove SIBO out of the gate. What else is going on? What could throw the breath test? What hasn't been looked at? Like, I wouldn't be doing my job otherwise. Otherwise, yeah. I'd just be that one more practitioner that was like, let's try this protocol. Let's try that one. And it, we've, we've got to look at things from a, like, yes, you know, we, we come in and then we back up and say, okay, what's, what's going on with the system? What is involved here? Do we have a heavy metal burden? Do we have a biotoxin illness? Like, what's getting in the way of that person healing? Yeah. Um, that's not everybody, but when you have a really chronic case, you have to start thinking like that um, to make sure that we're not missing something that's getting in the way. Um, so I really do think that um, I will see a lot of times that people just get this diagnosis after being uh, chronic for some time. They get this diagnosis and now, oh my gosh, this is it. I'm going to fix it. And it doesn't go that way because why were they chronic for so long? Yeah. What, what set the stage for this? So this absolutely, SIBO, once there has to be treated, it's not going to go away on its own. Mm. The treatment's going to look different for each person, but we yeah. do have to look at treating it. But then what, what else set it up? Um, it, are, are they hypothyroid? What else is going on with the gut? How, how is their immune system involved? Like, you know, where's, where's their endurance? Are they digesting properly? Do they have leaky gut? Like we, we have to look at all these. Um, you know, we, I think a, especially coming out of uh, school when I did, I've been in practice for you know, 12, 13 years now, and especially coming out of school when I did, everything was about detox, everything. Yeah. Everyone had candida, and <laughs> everything was about detox. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was just what we were taught. Like, it's just yeah. what you do. Um, no mention of SIBO ever in school. Um, it just had not kind of reared its head on the national stage yet, um, at least you know, clinically for what people were seeing. Um, but I think it, it's just interesting as we start to look at um, complex patients and kind of coming back to the idea of not, not, not that it ever left us, but coming back to the idea of detox even, because if the gut, if, if leaky gut is present and there's inflammation going on in the gut, the liver will not dump toxins at the rate that it once did. You have gates that actually shut down. And so the liver will send things back up into circulation or try to send it out through the kidneys. Yeah. So we see people become, you know, they, they now have, a whatever set up SIBO, um, hypersensitivity and reactivity in terms of what they're testing and sampling that's coming through their gut. They've got a bigger toxin load because they can't detox. Mm -hmm. They get extremely sensitive to everything. Um, and so we, we really just have to look at complex patients carefully, slowly, don't jump the gun in, ter gun in terms of treatment. We've got to really make sure that we're treating the right thing here and, and that we're not getting pigheaded as a practitioner and just saying, ah, this is the... I've got a protocol that's going to beat their protocol and we're going to kill it this time yeah. because that's not what it's about. It's never about yeah. kill. That word kill is just, it's just horrible. This is not C diff. Yeah. You kill C diff. But yeah. Would you say, bad. yeah. We need, yeah. We need that's what I was going to say. Would you say it's more of like a rebalancing your gut, right? It's rebalancing. It's, Absolutely yeah. rebalancing. And we do have to knock the load down. Yeah. But this isn't about kill, kill, kill. We've got to, we've got to shift the balance so we can then make the environment more hospitable to keep, keep the peace. Yeah. And especially with cr people with chronic issues with, I personally have a little bit of experience with just because that's why I'm so passionate about this issue. You can do like, there's, there has to be other things in your body, whether it's, you know, your immune system, your, you know, your adrenals, something else going on that is allowing this to recur, right? Like it's not natural for it to keep, keep recurring, even after you do different protocols. So it's so important to work with your doctor or work with whoever to, Try and figure out what else you can fix and strengthen in your body so that when you do use a treatment, right, it keeps it away. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, um, when you do use a treatment, you've created a foundation for that treatment to stick. Yeah. And that you do all the work on the other side of it. Um, it's not just about a prokinetic. We've got yeah. to heal up the gut, rebalance it, you know, regulatory pathways, and then start expanding the food, the diet. Yeah. supporting digestion um it's like all that's really really important otherwise it's that stage is set for it to come back yeah definitely yeah, so I, yeah i was gonna say like that that kind of makes me i always think about like we have medicines right but like 
they're usually kind of just a tool, right? To get us yeah. to the place where we want to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so lastly, I like to kind of, since you're, you know, a nutritional expert and, and gut health um, expert, I like to kind of see kind of how you maintain health and, and what you kind of have learned to, to personally um, improve your health. So what kind of diet tips do you stick to, to the, for the most part? Yeah, um, I, gosh, I protect my sleep as best I can. Like that's yeah. just, uh, um, my <laughs> husband has to sleep on the couch if I don't sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> I love him dearly. But I was like, yeah. I just need my space. The cats are yeah. out, he's out, and like I have to sleep. Um, so I always have to protect sleep. Um, and honestly, I just, I eat real food. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't live a grain free life. I, I eat gluten on occasion. I don't think yeah. it's evil. Um, a lot of yeah. people functional gut shouldn't have it in it, but, um, for the most part, um, you know, we have a garden, we have chickens. I, um, I am definitely more of a high fat, um, kind of person in terms yeah. of healthy fats and adding healthy fats. I think we, we, you know, we're, we're, we're meant to actually feel a lot off of those. Um, but mm. it's always, it's also plant-based, you know, 50%, you know, half my plate is always vegetables of some kind and some sort yeah. of mix. Um, and so I just live by that. Um, yeah, I, I I have to say, um, as a, and this is, I think true for a lot of practitioners, um, we don't take enough time for ourselves. Yeah. I I still fall into that realm. Um, and it's difficult because I think any person coming into this field, um, has to have a a fairly big degree of empathy and really working with the patients kind of carry a lot of that too. So it, it can be really hard as a practitioner in an area of people that have a lot going on and their lives are really, really interrupted by all of this. So it can be sometimes when you have a really, you know, it's hitting the patient hard. It's, it's hard on the practitioner too, but we, yeah, yeah we definitely. Spend- and, you know, thanks so much for all the work you do because, you know, even dealing with people who are going through chronic health issues and whatnot, it's a lot of, you know, it's an emotional, it's an emotional process as well too. So it's, it is. you have to find time for yourself, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what are some of your favorite comfort foods? Favorite, uh, chocolate, I eat chocolate every day. Um, yeah. uh, grapes are actually my favorite food. A <laughs> uh, couple French fries off of somebody else's plate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd say that's probably, those are probably my best comfort foods. Um, yeah. honestly, I, I love vegetables and I love, you know, if ice cream is brought out, I'll have a couple bites and I'm done. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, sweets don't entice me as much sometimes as, uh, any, anything chocolate, like flourless cake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have a, we have a factory here. Um, Theo's chocolate. I don't know if you, yeah. have you, do you know Theo's chocolate? I haven't heard of it now. Oh, you gotta have it. Um, so you're going to see it now. And just then back like, the man's name, Theo. Yeah. It's the only, uh, organic free trade chocolate manufacturer cool. in the United States. Do they and have it at like Whole Foods and stuff like that? Or? They have it at Whole Foods. Yeah, you'll okay. find it there. Easy. They're usually, it's a, it's kind of a white label and it has Theo's written across the top. Okay. Um, sea salt dark chocolate's my favorite. It's just so Ooh. good. So I have a couple scores of that every day. Yeah. Uh, but you can go on a tour there and they feed you so much chocolate that you come out drunk on chocolate. Wow. Like I, my uh, a, a, a girlfriend, my practitioner is also a girlfriend of mine. Um, we went and we came out and I said, I can't feel my feet because <laughs> we had so much chocolate. It was so good. Um, That's so I'm awesome. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a chocolate person, but it's like real, real chocolate. Yeah. Um, yeah it's that, it's good chocolate. I, yeah. I, I mean, I have my, you know, I make my coffee each morning here. That's probably my big vice. Yeah. I maybe have a couple of glasses of wine each week. Maybe. Um, yeah. I just, I like hydrating and eating real food and a salad is just as delicious to me as something chocolate. I just, I like, I love food. I'm a super yeah. taster. Everything tastes amazing to me. But it's, so. it's so important. That's why I even like to talk about this on a SIBO interview is yeah. because like, you know, it's important to have fun too. Right. And yes. like, that's part of healing. If you can get to that point where you can test out something yeah. very small quantity, that's like, yeah. that's really cool. You know, yeah, yeah. Theo's um, chocolate, um, their dark chocolate does not usually set anybody with SIBO off. They also have an orange flavor. They have a mint flavor. Um, my experience with people, they can have that. They can have a square. It would be totally fine. So if, and I, I finished, I don't want caffeine too close to bed. So I always, every single day, and I have like three bars underneath my computer here. <laughs> They're on my desk. Um, but every single day after lunch, I have two squares. Cool. Cool. That's my thing. I love it. 
Yeah. Um, and then any, any tools or tricks or helpful things that you do in your life to kind of maintain health? Uh, I schedule everything in, in terms of my activity. And I, I'll say I'm the first person to be like, delete, 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 delete. So I like, it's, I get it. I get it. Um, yeah. but, um, I really work on my breathing a lot. Um, I try to take a lot of deep breaths and a lot of diaphragmatic breaths, um, during the day. Um, I always have water at my desk and drinking that. Um, I just yeah. try to kind of set, my, set myself up for those habits. Um, and then I, I too, if I fall off working out, I will, I'll just make a goal to get to the gym. I don't care what I do there. Yeah. I don't care if I walk in the treadmill for 10 minutes and I'm just yeah. too exhausted to do anything else, but it's just setting that habit and then you, you step right back into it. Yeah, small so, steps, right? Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I think the idea sometimes, and you know, maybe not for this, the SIBO population is they're kind of working on some other things. Um, they, they need to walk and work on their health, don't get me wrong, and movement mm -hmm. and all of that. But I think a lot of people's ideas of, I'm going to get healthy, so now they're going to go like full force into boot camp yeah. or something, it never it never sticks. Like, it rarely sticks. It rarely sticks. It's just like, yeah. just start, start moving. That's, yeah, what, that's, that's the foundation. Exercises later, like that, what we consider exercise and you know, yeah. working out. Um, you, you just got to move. You, yeah. you can not sit all day, which I think is a big one for anybody. Yeah. And that's why personally, I'm not really a fan of like New Year's resolutions because yeah. like, you know, it's like if you're going to try and do all this stuff at once, it's like, it's not going to work out. You know, you have to start small and kind of implement those habits and those routines right. throughout your life. Um, right. Agreed. Um, yeah. So what advice would you give someone, you know, who's maybe struggling with gut issues, SIBO or, you know, they fought, they've tried a few different protocols and, you know, they're still not getting better. What would you kind of, what advice would you give them? Yeah. Um, I would say that they have to have to start working with a practitioner that, um, has a handle on this mm -hmm. and that can help them make sense of this. Um, because I think anyone, um, anyone trying to do this on their own is it's, it's going to be very difficult. It, it really is. I mean, I, I get budget. I understand. I understand that yeah people try all these different things and they've invested so much and it feels like it hasn't worked. I, I get, I get all of that. I really do. Um, they have to keep looking in their area. I think it's really important to have eyes on the patient that they're working closely with their doctor and then figuring out that team and putting that team together to see, see who else is going to be helpful. Um, and I'd say that the, you know, the, the summits are great. The Facebook, um, groups for like the SIBO SOS Summit and all, and you know, you know, following podcast. Um, Neurology Jacoby has amazing podcasts with the SIBO doctor. Yes. Those are wonderful, but they also get quite complex and are meant a little bit more for the practitioner. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, as a patient dealing with this, um, not everybody is meant for you. Not everything is meant for you. Not everything is meant for ah, now I have to do this. Oh, now I've got to add this in. Right. So I think we have to yeah. be really mindful that we're, we, we figure out what the patient actually needs. Um, and that's with any diagnosis out there. Awesome. And then if anyone wants to reach out and get help or, you know, use one of your services, where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my, my private practice site is evoguru.com. Um, and then if they want any recipe resources, uh, gutrxgurus.com. And that is uh, the subscription site for the FODMAP recipes. And Rebecca Coombs, all of her recipes are in there. Uh, we've got a, a big sub, big set of guest gurus that are that are you know kind of permanent guest gurus. Um, so you get access yeah. to them. You get access to me. Um, it's it's a really a great resource that I think people will find useful because it's you know we can't just give people a list of foods and think that they're going to completely shift gears when they're so overwhelmed with everything that's going on and just cook from scratch and know what they're doing. So, you know, this goes beyond cookbooks. Yeah. We're, we're uploading new recipes all the time and um, everybody in there gets 25% off um, all supplements. So it's really a, um, we, I do Q and A's, other, other guest gurus do Q and A's in there. So we really created this nice community that can be supportive. That about wraps it up. And I just want to thank you so much for joining me and sitting down to kind of talk about some of these issues and, you know, offering your help and your advice to other people. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having me.